So this is the third in a three-part series called Protecting Your Crops. Um, the first two series, one focused on uh, OMRI certified insecticides. Um, the second focused on pest management strategies. And this third one is focused on weeding um, and, and particularly flame weeding. So we're really excited uh, to kind of wrap up this you know, three-part series. And if you're interested in learning more, hearing more from the uh, first two series, you can view those on uh, the Common Grain Alliance website. So if you go to commongrainalliance.org backslash webinars, you can find a link to those recordings. Um, and VABF, I think, has some links as well to those for, for folks. So, um, Again, those are resources if you ever want to learn, and I uh, hope to uh, hope those are useful. And just really quick for those who don't know, I uh, wanted to introduce Common Grain Alliance and then pass it off to Lindsay to do the same for VABF. Um, Common Grain Alliance is a network of farmers, millers, bakers, chefs, um, and everyone in between throughout the Mid-Atlantic, focused on building a, a market and a, a very specific kind of regional grain economy in the Mid-Atlantic. And um, that group really got together when they started looking at the local food plate and seeing that, hey, you know, while staple grains and, and are a big part of what we eat, they're not necessarily talked about in the local food conversation. And there's an opportunity to be doing more around that. So as an organization, we do education like this, um, a number of networking and kind of market facilitation, just helping folks find um, opportunities and, and are building out more of a variety selection program too. So it's a good opportunity if you're interested in grain farming um, to get involved and, and learn from your peers and folks who have kind of um, you know, been, you know, testing the waters in the mid-Atlantic over the last, you know, however many years. So with that, I will turn it over to Lindsay for VABF. Thanks, Ben. Uh, VABF stands for the Virginia Association for Biological Farming, and we are the a 41-year-old organization, the leading nonprofit in Virginia that is promoting, advocating for, and educating about organic and biological farming and gardening. You can uh, join our network of organic and sustainable farmers and gardeners by signing up to be a member on our website, vabf.org. And um, we also have a monthly newsletter that goes out that keeps you apprised of all kinds of events and educational opportunities, um, state and national sustainable ag policy, gardening and farming tips, book reviews, recipes, and a lot more information. Um, we do appreciate your support. And if you become a VABF member, you can get discounts to all of our events, including our annual uh, conference, which will be in person again next January. Um, you can promote your business and farm on our website. We have events, classifieds, and job opportunity listings, and um, also partner discount codes. So with that, um, we appreciate y'all being here today. And um, we have Charles House talking to us today about flame weeding. He has been gardening professionally since 1983. He has worked in crop science research and is a certified horticulturalist. His company, Earth and Sky Solutions, um, consults on flame weeding with farms of all sizes and works with manufacturers to optimize equipment for smaller scale farms. We're excited to have Charles here today. And with that, uh, Charles, you can start sharing your screen. Okay. Your slides. Thank you. And while Charles is getting set up, I, I just wanted to let folks know that we'll be oh. monitoring the Q&A section. Um, so please add your questions throughout the presentation and we'll have some Q&A time at the end um, to discuss those. Uh, and if you have any issues, please let us know in the chat um, and we'll be monitoring that as well throughout the day. So take it over. Thanks, Ben. Hi, everybody. This is Charles here. Um, and this is who, who I am, who we are. 
and you can contact us um, at any of these numbers here. Contact us at waycooltools.com or earthandskysolutions.com, and you'll see some of these um, products that we sell at uh, Way Cool Tools and Earth and Sky uh, uh, here in the slideshow here. So flame weeding for farm and garden and the right tools for the job. And I know that um, some people have a, a fear of flame, <laughs> flame weeding and, and sometimes think that this is what they're gonna be doing with a flame weeder. And that's not the case. We're using a tamed flame. So flame weeding has been used you know, throughout history uh, to um, reclaim fields. You know, burning has been known to regenerate uh, growth, uh, improve soil, and uh, it's been used, you know, for many generations. But flame, uh, flame weeding is uh, not as new as you think it is. It's been around for quite some time. In, in fact, it was quite popular uh, in the uh, mid uh, 20th century. And, you know, with the advent of chemicals, the flame weeding just, you know, uh, became less of a, a, a go-to solution for weed control. A lot of people, as you know, just got roped in by these uh, chemical companies and it, chemicals became the go-to easy approach. But then, of course, you run into issues with that. Uh, health issues aside, it, it be, it's become challenging to use chemicals. So um, let's see, the advantages of flame weeding, of course, avoidance of chemical inputs and you don't disturb the soil, you don't dig up new weed seeds. And of course it's, it's less labor intensive. It's a USDA uh, organic program accepted practice. Uh, there's no chemical resistance, of course, with flame. Nothing is susceptible to the 2000 degree heat that propane can put out. And propane is an EPA certified clean fuel. It's a green gas, it's non-toxic. If it were to ever escape the container, which is highly unlikely, it will not pollute soil or contaminate uh, soil or water. And let's have a look at the options you've got for flame weeding. Uh, our torch line, the Red Dragon torch line has got four of the most popular torches, which is the Mini Dragon. Here, I, I guess you must be able to see my mouse moving there. The 100,000 BTU torch, the 400,000 BTU torch, and the 500,000 BTU torch, which is the original uh, Red Dragon torch. And this gives you an idea of what uh, the flame length is. And we'll show you a little bit more about that in uh, preceding slides. The Mini Dragon, we've got our, the Mini Dragon is a 25,000 BTU torch. Uh, it's, I call it a heat hoe. It, it's a real neat torch. It operates off of a small gas bottle, which it attaches here. And it, you can get fairly close to your, uh, your crop plants. And here's a little video. And by, this is at a friend of ours uh, farm. And this is all these uh, videos here are our friend Bill's first time using a flame weeder. So here we go.
<laughs> so you can see you can see that it's it's making the weeds change to a different color of green. They're not turning brown, but the the color of the weed is changing. You'll notice in all these little videos, that's what's going on. So what's happening is the water inside the cells is boiling and breaking the cell walls. And that's what you're seeing, a sort of perspiration that's happening as the uh, flame weeding is going on. So here's another video of that. So you can get pretty close to your, your crop plants with this. And I think uh, later on in this video, you'll see um, that I had flamed pretty close to a, uh, a wild carrot in that situation. Okay, so with flame weeding, you can get pretty close to other plants and the direction of the, of the flame, the way you uh, point that flame at, at the weed you're trying to get um, and away from the crop, will, that will help you with your hand torch flaming. And you can see here, you can use um, your mini dragon a lot of people use the mini dragon to poke holes in their plastic mulch in order to uh, set their plants in there. And this is where this was really it, it was a split second of holding the mini dragon torch up and then lowering it down just enough to where it melted the plastic. And that hole to the right is the, just done with the heat of the bell on the mini dragon just to punch a hole in it. And here is the flame pattern in low light. Okay, and I hope that's not too loud. Uh, the, the sound on this is not too loud and I can't hear feedback right now, but uh, I guess you need to adjust your volume on your computer if the, if the noise of these torches is too loud. What that is, is it's, it's air being pulled in to the uh, torch and that's just sort of a jet noise sort of sound. Um, so in low light, you can see the flame pattern. So that's something you might wanna do uh, with your torch is go into the garden or into some area like a, a driveway or something and just use your torch in low light to get used to the width of the flame at various torch angles. You notice we're using the torch straight up and down and at an angle to show the, the pattern that you can get from the flame in, in those positions. The, the next size up torch, uh, of course, that mini dragon hooks up to a little one pound cylinder, and we'll see more about that later. Uh, the next three torches connect to a, a barbecue grill tank. You can connect it to the uh, backpack flamer tank, which is a 10 pound tank or a five pounder. Um, any type of um, propane cylinder that's got a POL valve on it. Um, it's um, 100,000 BTU, and here, here we, we're flaming kind of close to some cilantro that, uh, you know, just overwintered. A lot of these videos we, we've done uh, in early spring.
<laughs> okay, so there's, um, you know, Bill flaming with the 100,000 and uh, I was explaining to him that you can, you can, if you're flaming next to a plant, one way to do it is you can flame from behind the plant in, or, in order not to get it, or just get used to your flame pattern and slide from uh, toward the plant just close enough to where the flame doesn't affect it. And if you, and du flame duration will affect your plant. If you hold the, the torch um, in one place long enough, it will affect the plant even at a distance. And the, the zone between the end of the torch, the torch bell and the ground is a heat zone. That's gonna be that, that temperature, you know, as high as the flame is. So if you're next to a plant that's say only four inches tall and you get a little too close, it'll get the whole plant on the one side. Uh, if, and that's something you'll need to experiment with. You may end up, um, if you get close enough to your plant with that heat zone and it does get the whole plant, likely it won't kill the whole plant if, if it's mature enough. You, it may survive, but you'll, you'll get damage and it'll have to regrow. So that's something that you'll need to um, keep in mind when you're flame weeding. Now here's the flame pattern on that 100,000 torch. Again, sorry if this is too loud. So you can see with the 100,000 torch, you can, you can um, just barely touch the soil using the end of the flame, or you can mushroom that flame out uh, so it's a wider flame. That's the same case with any of these torches. Um, this is the 400,000 BTU torch, which I think for any market farmer is about the best torch you can get. It's a, a good size flame. It uses less fuel than the 500,000 BTU torch. We use ours with the squeeze valve and it, uh, it produces plenty of flame. It's not quite as heavy and again, uses less fuel. And here's a little video of, we had some apple trees they are much bigger now. We had those uh, surrounded by a, a, a wire fence and you can, flame right through it. Okay, and you can see that ha that happens pretty quick. Uh, uh, it doesn't take very long to kill a weed. A weed, it, it's a split second is enough to boil that water and break the cell walls. And here's that torch in low light. Mm. <laughs> okay, so that that's the four hundred thousand, and I hope you can uh, that these videos are enough to show you the 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 potentiality of these torches, the flame pattern that you can get from it. This next video of this, you'll see that you can take 
that big torch and actually come out with a smaller flame. And again, you can do that with any of these torches. And here's Okay, so Bill was was flaming pretty close to some deer netting, and we'll see uh, in a in another slide here that you know he he, did, he didn't harm the netting, and he got fairly close to it. And also, uh, this is Bill. This was Bill's first time, our friend Bill's first time using any flame weeding equipment, and you'll see he did a pretty good job. There was a few, a few missed areas in it. Uh, on the left here, you can see the deer netting, and you can see it wasn't quite flamed as much up up through here, but there are your your dead weeds in here. You can see here fairly close to these other plants. It looks like we have some irises there, fairly close to those, and that was with I think that was with the four hundred thousand BTU torch there. So you, even with a bigger torch, you can get pretty close to your, um, your crop plants in, in some situations. That would be like, for instance, if you're growing um, tomatoes or something like that, that's got a stem to it where it's not all leaf, you can get pretty close with a big torch and, and you can move a lot faster with a larger flame. Again, that's why I like the 400,000 BTU torch. And here's that 500,000 in low light. And you'll see that, um, I was toggling the flame and that is without the squeeze valve. I'm just using the needle valve on that. Okay, <laughs> you hear the spring peepers. If you notice that there are some uh, uh, places in that video there where the same the flame pattern seemed to change a little bit, where it, the flame would hit a deflection, something maybe a little bit larger, a dirt cloud or something like that, that's going to change the flame pattern. If you're flaming uh, in soil that's got a lot of clods in it, 
you'll find that if you're flaming from one direction, that if the flame hits, say, a dirt clod that's big enough, what's behind that clod will not be affected by the heat. It's like a shield. So it's something to keep in mind when you're doing your flame weeding. Um, the, uh, let's see here. The, uh, here, this is uh, uh, an illustration of the squeeze valve. It, it comes in a few different sections. You need to assemble that when you put it together. It, um, it's a great tool. It's basically the same as the needle valve, but you have a, a plunger which incrementally opens uh, the, the fuel port. So you can control the intensity of the flame and of course, conserve fuel. So that's a, a good option. We like the squeeze valve. We use that on one of our torches. And here is, well, you've, you've seen it, but here's a little demonstration of the squeeze valve. Uh, and sorry about that. If this, if it's too loud, I'm turning it down. I'm, I'm sorry if it's too loud. I'll go ahead and. So you see, I, I had the torch bell too close to the cover crop and it starved itself of oxygen. And that's why it went out. It's another reason why I carry the spark ladder in my pocket. Hey, Charles, this is Lindsay. Um, we can't hear any sound from the videos. Oh, really? On the attendee end, yes. Wow, okay. Um, hang on a second. Now, is it because I turned the sound down? No. It's just no sound. No sound. We can oh. see the video playing, but I don't get any sound. Interesting. Oh, boy. I'm kind of technologically challenged. It shouldn't matter. Most of these videos, even if it didn't have sound, you should be able to get what we can out of it. Um, uh, one of the attendees says when you share the screen, you have to select to share audio as well. Oh, wow. Okay. And then I would do that by, uh, let's see, let's see, share screen. That says new share. And let's, okay, one moment. Do you know how I would do that, Lindsay? I'm not sure, Ben. Do you know? Start video, mute. Hang on. Nope. Uh, Joe from the attendee says you have to stop the share and reshare again. Okay. Now, all I see right now is new share up here. Okay, share screen. Got it. Got it. Thank you. And we go back to that. Is there any other thing I need to do on the way in here? If you can select share audio, if that's an option. Let's see. Oh, share sound. There you go. Perfect. Optimize for video clip. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are good to go. 
then I would go to Do you know how to make this top panel go away so I can get to the uh, the controls on the PowerPoint? Yeah. Uh, Charles, if you click the bottom down at the bottom of your PowerPoint screen, that presentation on the right next to the minus sign. Yeah, this here? Slide no, oh, yeah. there you go. There Got you it. Go. Thank you. That should put you in a false And we're back. All right. Well, I tell you what, I, I've been concerned that everybody would hear hear this roaring sound in their ears if they had headphones on. This is which and, one? Uh, 400,000 with squeeze on. But the one the one takeaway from this video is when the when the torch went out. Can you hear that now? Is it too loud? So yeah, the one takeaway from that video is the fact that if you get your your flame, the torch bell, too close to the ground, or in this case, it was sort of too close to a cover crop, and it was starving that whole area from oxygen, so it blew the torch out. Um, so it's a good idea to carry your spark lighter in your pocket. Another thing you can get from this, this was uh, a rye cover crop at a CSA just down the road from here. And we were just using it for something to flame. One thing I can tell you about the rye is it's a pretty resilient crop. Uh, it will come back. We, we, we went and we, we ashed it. We brought it all the way down to the ground, but you still had a living crown and it came back from the crown. Uh, grasses are like that. They're pretty resilient, but you'll see later on that, uh, Many farmers and many row crop farmers are using rye as a cover crop or a rye hairy vetch mix as a cover crop, and they're rolling and crimping it. And uh, you can find out more about that from the Rodale Institute. We've been working with them over the years, and what we've done is uh, we've utilized flame weeding to suppress the cover crop. Once it's crimped down, it'll lay flat. And when you have a good stand and what has happened is once they lay the cover crop down, it will want to regrow, right? So the flame is another addition just to keep that top, to kill that top layer and it'll smother uh, what's underneath it. And it's worked out quite well. So anyway, so the, here's some uh, on the topic of squeeze valve, the all three of these Larger torches work with the squeeze valve. And then your options for ease of mobility. Of course, that propane tank's kind of heavy. So you, there's a dolly cart you can carry it with. You can also use a smaller tank. Some people use a, a five pound tank to, um, to flame weed with. The, uh, the torches all come with a 10 foot hose on it, except for you can see the backpack flamer if you if you get a complete backpack flamer, you will receive a smaller hose with that. So it's got a shorter hose. And of course, that, that's a good thing just to keep you from tripping over it and getting tangled while you're carrying a backpack on your back with a propane tank. And, and this is all real safe to do. All these tanks are real safe to use. We'll get into some other aspects of that uh, in a minute here. So your fueling options, of course, for your smaller torches, you've got your one pound cylinder. There are one pound refillables on the market. And we're, in fact, we're gonna, uh, we were at one point working with a company out in California to, for a lighter 
uh, less expensive refillable cylinder. And we'll, we'll likely be doing that at some point in the near future, again, at waycooltools.com. Uh, another neat thing for your Mini Dragon, if you like to carry that with a, a, a backpack flamer, is this coiled up um, uh, deal here. That is a, an adapter where you can uh, connect to your um, Mini Dragon here and connect that up to your uh, tank, be it a grill tank or a, a 10 pound backpack tank. And the walk behind vegetable bed flamer, um, real neat tool, straddles the bed. It's got five of the 400,000 BTU torches on it. And one good thing about what the walk behind bed flamer does is it'll eliminate mist areas. It's gonna give you a contiguous flame across the bed where you just walk and it happens a lot quicker too. It's simpler to, uh, to use. And here we are, this is just a little demonstration of it on those rye beds. I like the light with a mini dragon. You can light it with a spark tool too, but the mini dragon's always a nice safe way to light it. It's our daughter Zoe. I adjust it up to probably about 50 PSI on that regulator on it. You can see the, the, the handles offset so you can walk next to the bed. concerned about the the uh the volume here and i'd like to be able to turn it down i hope that's not too loud we'll go back here you can see how i was getting the pathway on it too so it's sort of catching about a half or two thirds of the bed go back up the other side. Okay, and you can see the um, this torch rail here, that's adjustable. So it it adjusts to the operator. This handle, you, you can adjust the height on that. You can adjust the angle of the torches. So it makes it comfortable to use and you get a good even flame from that. And this is the cover crop after it was flamed. As you can see, it's starting to, starting to wilt and die. And then this is the same same beds after the fact. It um you can see it's more or less dead, but you can see it's it's starting to grow back. And it, it again the rye will grow back. It was this was something we just used because it was something to flame, and we we were helping with the beds over there. Uh, this is actually a few renditions of the uh, bed flamer. And this is really what it's known for is pre-emergent flaming, which is really a lot of what you're gonna be doing uh, on a small scale farm or even a, a, a larger scale farm. Vegetable bed flaming is mostly done prior to planting. Now with uh, slower germinating crops like carrots, uh, you can plant your carrots and flame weed uh, one or more times prior to the emergence of the carrots. Um, one way to do that is to sow uh, some beets in the same area where you're planting your carrots. When the beets come up, flame. The carrots will come up within a day or two. And the uh, another way to do it is you can use a, a 
a pane of glass. You keep the bed irrigated and put the glass down on one section of the bed. And when you see the leaves first beginning to emerge under the glass, then that is a good time to flame. And the, the, the carrots will come up within a day or two after that. And here is a little video of the, um, this is one of the earlier renditions of the uh, GF 2011. We were still testing it at that point. So it's got a little different handle on it. And that little girl in the backpack behind mommy is the same little girl that was in the field over there 11 years later. <laughs> so and you can see you can use it in, in a greenhouse situation, in a field situation. It's a real neat, real neat tool. And of course, you can put the handle on this behind the flamer, just uh, uh, installed in a different way. And now you've got to walk behind flamer. You can take off uh, one of the axle sections and, and uh, make the wheels uh, closer together, easier to use in a situation like this. And you can flame um, you know, any kind of paved area or wherever you need to on the farm. See that that's a that's a little different there too. The design on that that little flap has kind of gone away and turned into kind of a a stand. The uh, other uh, things you can do with this is you can shut off the individual torches by adding a ball valve, and uh, you can put a 45 degree angle and kind of turn it into a row crop flamer, a flamer for doing your your currants, your berries, things like that. So it's it's. Um, a real versatile tool in that regard. And uh, when to flame, flame weeds when they're still small. And uh, a lot of, we've run into row crop uh, farmers that wait when they have a row crop flamer, they wait till the weeds are big enough uh, for them to get out there and, and cultivate. But you can get out there much earlier to flame in your fields. You can actually flame, and we'll see in a little while, when when your plants are quite small, your actual crop is quite small. So I say if you if you can get on your knee and see a pinhead, that's a good time to flame. A pinhead side size weed is a great time to flame. And also with flame weeding, you're you're killing whatever weed seeds you can get to on the surface. Uh, uh, growers have told me that over the course of a few seasons, they've noticed a, uh, a diminishment in the weed pressure in their fields because you're killing off weed seeds too as opposed to chemicals. And of course, it takes very little time. You can see in those videos that right when that color change happens in the weed, that weed is dead. And um, it really takes very little time to, to flame a weed. So it happens pretty quick. You can see in this slide, there's a little fingerprint there. And that is a, a good way to check to see if you've done the job. After you flame, go back take a, a leaf between your, your finger and your thumb and just give it a little squeeze and you'll see that you've got a, a fingerprint there. Or it might just, you know, it, with a really small weed where you can't really see a fingerprint so well, you, it'll, it'll feel mushy. And that is an indicator that those cell walls are broken. Um, wind speed and direction, you wanna be aware of that. And I tell people, if you are gonna flame and you wouldn't spray, don't flame. Now flame is a little bit more forgiving. It does, there's no wind drift on it, but you won't, you may get a, uh, a lesser flame pattern uh, or a not even flame pattern because of the wind. So pay attention to the wind. And of course the wind, if, you, if something does catch on fire, it could move it somewhere to where there's more combustible material. So if there's a lot of combustible material, in the area, you may want to clean it up before you flame. Of course, uh, don't flame poisonous plants like poison ivy, oak, or sumac. They'll volatilize uh, just like any other moisture in the plant leaf. That, that 
the poison will volatilize and get into the atmosphere. So if you're in an area where there's a lot of that, don't do it. Um, combustible material, you were seeing in those videos that the there were leaves catching on fire and that sort of thing. Well, that's going to go out on its own in a, in a situation where it's not windy or if it's not up against something where it will harm something. That little piece of combustible material will burn itself out with, within a few seconds. Um, of course, use caution, have water available to put, put the flame out. But you'll notice when you're flaming, it, it, if something catches on fire, it really, uh, most of the time in a row crop situation or a garden situation, is not going to be a big deal. And um, of course, wear shoes when you're flame weeding because you can always use those to step on whatever you need to that may need put out. Um, safety check your equipment before each use and begin at the fuel source. You start at the tank and we'll see a little bit of a uh, little video. It's got some uh, video of leak checking your uh, equipment. You want to make sure you don't have any leaks. So you start at the tank and you check each connection from the tank forward to the torch just to make sure that you don't have any leaks. Um, and of course, you, uh, this is the, on this slide, it talks about you need to get your tanks recertified and make sure they're uh, up to date in their inspections. And here's your little video. Uh, brass parts. The brass is a soft metal and it can be dented easily or stripped easily, more easily than steel. So this this is a standard POL. You uh, attach it to your propane tank just by uh, left, left hand threading it. This goes the opposite way that you normally do a normal fitting. Use left handed thread onto your tank. Another type of fitting that you can get as an option is a, a hand tightener. Same thing, left hand threads, hand tightens into the fitting. This fitting comes standard with the 100,000 BTU torch. And this is a quick disconnect. You know, we've, we've made our system work with this and a quick disconnect. This is the end of the hose where normally you would have your uh, POL fitting. You can put this fitting on the end and it just, it connects just like that. It's a safe fitting, quickly disconnects. And uh, you just thread that into the tank like that. Now. Another thing you want to keep in mind for safety is to check your, your POL fitting. Now you notice this one has got a couple of cracks that can happen over time. It'll dry rot and get cracked. So it's easy enough to remove this, this with a knife and then just replace it with a new one like that. Simple. good to go. Now, before you, you run your propane torch, go ahead and do a safety check on it. Slowly open this valve. If you open it really quick, you might hear a little, a little click. And what's happened is inside here, there's a check lock because it, it detects that there might have been a rupture in the system and it'll shut this valve off. And it either won't work or it'll go real slow. But, so go ahead and just, everywhere there's a connection, See, there's a connection here, another one here. Just go ahead and put a little bit of this leak check. With most of these torches, you'll get a little bottle of leak check just like this. And just go ahead and do a, a safety check to make sure that you're good to go. Uh, now, another neat thing about this valve, and cameraman, uh, just watch out. You can disconnect it like that. And this tank is on, 
put the valve shut and that's that's how that works so it's a safe a safe tool to use Okay, so in that video where I disconnected that that uh, dis quick disconnect uh, from the valve, and you saw a little just a, a, a little bit of vapor ex escape right there. Uh, that is not how you would disconnect that fitting. You would shut the tank off first. But if you did, that that safety feature comes into play. Uh, brass. Um, and here's a little bit more information on that. We already went over. You just make sure you inspect your equipment. That O-ring, it's important if it is cracked, which it can every, you know, maybe a couple of years or so, you may notice that it starts to uh, dry rot. Uh, it can also um, shrink. And uh, so it's something that you'd want to replace. You can get those on Amazon. They're, they're POL O-rings and they're, they're really common. They're like 30 cents a piece. You can get them just about anywhere. And uh, yeah, do not over tighten your, your equipment. And I, I talked about in that video, brass is a soft metal and you can you could crack uh, a brass fitting or strip it by over tightening, just tighten it down just so much. And um, the, um, the, that POL, when it uh, is threaded into your tank, sometimes we'll get calls from people that Oh, their torch isn't working, and it turns out if they just turned it another eighth or quarter of a turn, it will push in the safety valve on the propane tank. There's a safety valve in there that if that POL isn't pushed in all the way, it won't allow fuel to flow. So that's something to keep in mind. And um, yeah, here's here's your information on that. We. You can get these little kits uh, that have a few of these quick disconnects and the quick disconnect uh, fitting there. It's a good thing to have if you're using more than one kind of torch. It's just easier to do to, than unthreading it from the tank. And here we are with our information on uh, leak checking. And, and this is what you'll see if you do have a leak you'll see little bubbles like that. And the leak check that comes with your torch is a really neat thing. Some people use soapy water. And if you don't have anything, that's a great thing to use. Um, but this leak check solution is a great thing to uh, have. Uh, your propane man has got it on their, their delivery trucks all the time. If you ever needed any of that and you have a propane service, you can always ask your propane guy for some. probably be happy to give you a little bit. And of course, new, never use an open flame to check for leaks. Now, we're uh, Lindsay. We're at we've we've covered all the uh, hand torches, and we're about to get into some tractor mounted stuff. And uh, after that, we'll we'll have completed this part of it and be opened up to questions. And after that, we can go on and look at a lot of other equipment if they if anybody cares. So we've got the row crop flamers, we've got orchard flamers for doing hops and um, um, grapes and apples and uh, any kind of fruit crops like that, that's coming up. But that won't be in this unless somebody wants to see that. Uh, tractor mounted uh, systems all come with a uh, control box. You've got a master switch, which uh, opens up the solenoid from the propane tank that you're using. Now, these are liquid systems. They're not vapor. They don't run off of the grill tanks. Uh, they run off of typically anywhere from a forklift tank on up to a 250 or 500 gallon tank for tractor mounted systems. Uh, or I, I didn't mention a 120 tank too. Um, so you've got a master switch and a full flame switch. So, and we'll see how that works in uh, another one of these slides this this knob right here is how the gas flows into the system and um, this is a full flame solenoid so when this solenoid is activated it it bypasses this loop and lets the fuel flow at the con that the at the pressure that you set on a regulator 
So here's our uh, bed flamers. You can do these anywhere from a five foot up to about a 30 foot wide system. And here's a small scale uh, vegetable bed flamer. And this is one of our little small scale systems that runs off of two 10 gallon forklift tanks. And um, it, it, a lot, it, this is what a lot of um, small scale growers are going to. Go, go ahead. Okay. So we're gonna turn our pilot controller on, open our pilot valve a little bit, fuel tanks are on, we got our torches shut off, we're gonna open one, light the two. You just got the pilot set pretty low on that for lighting with a, a spark tool like that. So this is a stale seed bed flaming. You notice you really can't see the flame pattern that well in uh, daylight, most daylight situations. So that uh, taking your flamer out at night and using it in low light will give you a good idea of the flame pattern. That low one down. get the idea about that <laughs> and there this is a picture of a uh, the same uh, flaming uh, unit but with a larger tank that's the 120 tank uh, keeps you from having to go get your tanks filled as often that'll hold 100 gallons of fuel and then row crop flamers uh, is another thing that uh, I think some of the people here are interested in. Uh, you can you can flame a lot of different things, and this is one of the configurations of torches. This is 
a staggered flaming, which flames uh, at ground level through the row. And you can see it's just, you just flame under the crop canopy. So once the crop is up, say a foot or so high, sometimes in some cases it could be a little shorter. Yeah, as long as you can get under the canopy, um, it, you can safely flame. Uh, as long as you're not flaming from the top down, like for instance, with corn, corn will keep elongating, even if you damage some of the lower leaves on it, it'll keep growing. And we'll see some more um, information on that coming up. Here's your, an illustration of uh, the cross flaming uh, that you do with these row crop flamers. Torch uh, uh, flames in from the side and gets the crop row that way. And there's various torches available. These are the three main torches on most of our equipment. The bottom one, the LT, uh, one half by six is uh, pretty uncommon. We don't normally use that, but in some real close row spacings, I've got one we're doing this year. It's they're on like 20 inch spacing, so we're using that torch. Um, the LT two by eight is the one used in vegetable bed flaming, and sometimes in row crop flaming, as well as in, in hemp and tobacco, and um, that sort of situation. LT one and a half eight D is the common torch used on 30 inch row spacing. And <laughs> this is video is going kind of fast. I guess that's how it turned out in PowerPoint. But anyway, so this is a this is a, a pre-emergent flaming in corn using the row crop. Now some growers will will get a row crop flamer, but a conversion kit to switch out into vegetable bed flaming parts. So you can just flame the whole field uh, in, in a band instead of just in the row. And you can flame corn uh, when it's just emerging in that state. What will happen is it'll get flame back. A lot of people up north tell me, oh, that's like a frost. Uh, and it'll grow right back. As long as the growing point is in the soil uh, the, and protected by the soil, it'll, it'll come back. You can do that once, uh, up to three to four leaves. In soybeans, you can flame a soybean when it's in the crook stage like that. Still laying down, you can see it's exposed, but you can get a flame over that. It'll kill all those other uh, weeds around it and then the, the soybean will keep growing and open up. And at that point, you'll wait till it's about 10 inches to a foot high. And here, it, this is a situation where a grower had, he had ordered a, a, um, a kit, a row crop flaming kit, which by the way, we, we've got uh, complete units in the, uh, in, in, in the row crop, or even in the vineyard and orchards. And you can also get a kit and utilize your own frames and propane tank. But this is with the larger torches uh, set up uh, to flame vertically instead of through the row. So he had healed that up, he had cultivated a lot but was able to overcome that and still flame uh, and get the row by setting his torches up that way. So the, um, and in this situation that uh, those soybeans got, it looked like they got scalded on the side. And I followed up with this guy, oh, probably within, probably a month or so later, and uh, he said, oh, he said they came back and it didn't even look like anything happened to them. And of course they produced a good crop. So soybeans are, as long as you don't get the top of the plant, they'll, they'll come back uh, even after being flamed like that from the side. It wasn't the whole plant, it was just the, the bottoms of the plant that got flamed. Um, here's a situation where we, this is a no-till field, okay? And so we 
took off what is normally a skid plate on the bottom of that uh, that leg there, that the skid just uh, rides along on the ground like that. But we put these wheels on in order not to not disturb the uh, cover crop. And you're going to see what looks like smoke, but this is steam in this picture. Oh, hang on. That's odd. Bear with me, y'all. This is a. This should be a, a video here. Well, if anybody wants to see this, I can put it up on Google Drive or something. We can uh, make it available to see up there, because uh, this is not playing. This is um, tobacco, and I think I'm gonna. Stop right by here because I've I only intended to go down to um, the um, no-till, but let's have a look at this because this is interesting. You can see in, in tobacco, <laughs> you can flame. You can flame tobacco, and it doesn't. It, it it's really amazing how you can flame right up against the plant, and it does not. Heard it. Yeah, you know, I might have one more video on on hemp. There we go. If anybody's doing hemp. Lindsay, I think uh, we probably ought to go to uh, open up the uh, questions and answers time here. I just realized we're about quarter after one here. Okay, thanks, Charles. Um, we've got five questions in the Q&A. Okay. And some of these you might have already answered, but I'm going to read them anyway in case there's anything okay. else you want to add. Um, from Leah, I'm most interested in using flame weed to maintain ho horse pastures. Unfortunately, the pastures are fenced in with wood board. Would you caution against using flame weeding in this instance? No, I wouldn't. No, it's real, it's real hard to catch wood on fire. I mean, if you've got a wood stove or a fireplace, you notice that you know, the logs don't instantly light on fire. Uh, you can flame up against wood fences. Uh, you probably would end up using a hand torch. Or to, uh, in, in a larger situation, you could use one of the, uh, the uh, vineyard flamers, which is, um, let's see. Um, something like one of these deals where it's got a, uh, an arm that goes out and just, you know, you can just drive along and get all your fence lines that way. That's another way to do it. 
uh, some people will use uh, a like a, a four wheeler or buggy of some sort to um, carry a propane tank and just drive along with a hand torch that like that. We also make uh, Flame Engineering Red Dragon makes a um, a longer handled torch. If that is something you need to do your fence lines with more easily, say like from a vehicle. And then as far as the field goes, uh, what a lot of people are using is either the vegetable bed flamer uh, or in some cases the alfalfa flamer. So the, the alfalfa flamer is, let's see, Here, here's an alfalfa flamer. Hang on, let's see if this is a video that plays. Hang on. Here it is. That's a video. So the alfalfa flamer uses a whole bunch of fuel. It uses 20 to 30 gallons of, of propane an acre. Uh, originally made to kill uh, dotter and weevil in, in alfalfa. But some people use it. In fact, I've got a guy out. Uh, Tennessee right now. We've been texting back and forth this morning. He's got his alfalfa flamer running out there in Tennessee this morning. That's basically what it is. is it's a liquid spray system, sprays liquid propane into the ground. It gets into what I call the, the, the air voids in, in between the stems of the plant and, and ignites on the ground by way of some pilot torches. Does a real good job, but may not be necessary for your hay field. This guy is doing that in his, his hay field. Uh, right now. And so I hope that answers that question. Again, we've got the um, email up here. You're welcome to email or call anytime. And um, I'll get back with you right soon. Um, how does flaming affect English ivy or poison ivy? Does it inhibit future growth? Um, don't spread, again, don't flame poison ivy or any poisonous plants with volatile oils in them. Uh, ivy, no, nah, you, you're, you know, you'll kill it. You, you, you know, it's, it's really not worth it with ivy. Here's, uh, for instance, for one thing, it's got a very thick leathery leaf, and you notice in the, um, the, the video with the tobacco. Tobacco's got a lot of oils in the leaf, okay, and I think that's why it doesn't get as affected. You can't, you know, if you get a flame right on that leaf, it'll, it'll scorch it, but getting the heat near it doesn't hurt it. Uh, the way that that flamer works is the flame just goes all the way up into the row under the leaves and it does a good job. That's why. Now with ivy, it's the same thing. It's got a thick leaf full of oils and it's going to be hard to kill. It's going to be slow going. Another thing about flaming, uh, like when I was speaking about the clods and you notice in the videos uh, about the, um, the rye cover crop, is one leaf on top is going to protect that which is underneath. So I don't suggest flaming um, uh, English ivy. I suggest taking a grub hoe or a, a tractor bucket to it to get it out of there it, it's, and stay away from poison ivy with flame. OK, thank you. Um, how about the success of using flame weeding to destroy weed seeds? How long, oh, yeah. how long does the flame need to be applied to a green plant to kill it? or its weeds? Okay, a green, a, depending on the green plant, okay, uh, it, a millisecond, a tenth of a second is all it really needs to get killed. Now, some leaves, you'll notice when you're using, say, a hand torch, it may take a second to wilt instead of a half a second or a tenth of a second. Um, and it all depends on your heat and intensity, um, your ground speed, right, with a, you know, in a, tractor type situation, or even you walking with a hand torch, ground speed, uh, fuel pressure or flame intensity, okay, and uh, the maturity of the plant. And so that that answered the question on uh, the how long does it take? And what was your other question, uh, Lindsay? Um, the success of using flame weeding to destroy the weed seeds. And you could see in that video there where that uh, that was Trey Fleming there up at Tugander Farm in, in Pennsylvania. He was going relatively slow, uh, slower than I might have, but that's 
fine. That's going to give you a good kill in a, a stale seed bed situation to kill whatever weed seeds are there on the surface. Now, soil is a real good uh, insulator, like in the situation with uh, flaming corn at the early growth stage. As long as that growing point is protected by the soil, it'll regrow from the growing point. So you're not going to kill a whole bunch of seeds down under the soil surface. That would uh, Some people, for instance, will uh, do a stale seedbed flaming. They'll irrigate, wait a while, like a couple days, and then go back over it again before they plant, or even a third time before they plant, especially if you're in a situation where you know you've had a lot of weed pressure in that field. And... Are there any problems with the flame discoloring brick, concrete, or asphalt for removing weeds around the house? Uh, no, uh, that should not be a problem. The only thing that, like, for instance, if you have something that's burning, you know, you may um, get soot or something like that on it, but the flame itself is not going to discolor anything. Although, um, let me think, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you applied it for a long time, you could get it to discolor. You know, we're talking an extended period of time. Some people will use flame in concrete to get a patina. Okay, but they're like they're like hammering it with flame. You know, just hanging out in one spot and really hitting it with flame. But uh, typically, no, you're not going to get any kind of issues on, you know concrete or or um, asphalt or um, now up against a building you, you're going to be careful you know as long as it's brick or masonry you're good to go um, d don't flame uh, if you've got even if you've got like say vinyl siding four inches off the ground uh, you're you're playing with fire there <laughs> you might end up melting it you might end up warping it uh, if you get close to vinyl siding Okay, and then lastly, we have um, what are the costs of the different units of the hand torches? Oh boy, um, maybe just general. Generally speaking, maybe. from the seventies to in in the uh, fifty to eighty bucks, something like that, eighty ninety dollars for a hand torch. You can look at waycooltools.com, and they're they're all there. I know on our backpack flamer, you can get the, the backpack flamer probably cheaper at Wake Old Tools than you can anywhere else. Okay, that's all the questions that have been turned in so far. Does anyone else okay. want to raise their hand and ask a question directly?